questions. Hmm. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. Great. Stop the share just to make sure I am recording. All right. <clears throat> just to review the schedule. Oops, that's too far. We are on chapter one. We should finish that today. The Plagy quiz is due on Friday. You have to take the Plagy tutorial before taking the Plagy quiz. And then remember on next Tuesday, there's a practice quiz. You can get one extra credit point if you take that. <clears throat> on Thursday, we'll be starting chapter three. We might get started on chapter three a little bit today. All right, any questions about what we're doing? Oh, we're going to have a lab today. Let me uh, bring that back up. Uh, no, there is no lab today. Uh, so what I'll be is I'll come to the lab and uh, I will just ask you if you have questions. <clears throat> so you're supposed to be working on the Plagy quiz and the tutorial. Oh, I need to discuss in the lab uh, the infectious disease project. So I'll do that today. Are you guys hearing me? I was talking kind of quiet there. Yeah, we can hear you. Great. All right, I think I can minimize that. Let's go to the lesson. Down here someplace. Here we go. So the last slide I think we did was we talked about the birth of modern chemotherapy. Could somebody confirm that? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so the birth of modern chemotherapy <clears throat> in 1910, Paul Ehrlich started looking at different chemicals, trying to find what he called a magic bullet, a chemical that could be used against a, a disease-causing organism and would harm that organism and would leave the patient unharmed. Now, in reality, he never found one that left the patient unharmed. He did find what he called a magic bullet, but it was an arsenic compound, and it obviously made the patient uh, sick. And if he took too much of it, I'm sure it would have killed the patient, but uh, he did at least not cure, kill patients. <clears throat> so that was really the first of the modern chemotherapy. And then later, you don't need to know the year here, but in 1928, Alexander Fleming discovered the first antibody. What he had done was he streaked out his plates and he did it sort of sloppily. And then he went off on vacation for the weekend or something like that. He, he went away from his lab. And when he came back, he discovered he had left the plates on the counter. That was important because the room temperature 
allowed bath, both the uh, bacteria and the mold to grow. If he had put it in his incubator, only one of those organisms would have grown well, I should say. Uh, so, so his growing it at room temperature allowed both of them to grow. And he, he had been sort of sloppy in his streaking of the plates, and he saw something similar to this. Let me blow that up just a little bit. Or actually, I'll blow it up here. Where he had a plate with a streak of bacteria on it, but there was a, a mold colony in its penicillium mold. And he noticed around the mold colony, there was a region where the bacteria were not growing. And he correctly concluded that something was coming out of the mold colony in preventing or killing the bacteria growth. And he called that substance an antibiotic. And he found it coming from the penicillium mold, it's a fungus, and so we call that chemical compound penicillin. And that's, correctly speaking, would be penicillin G. Any question about that? Now that was the first antibiotic that was discovered, kind of by accident. I mean, if he had been a good microbiologist, he would have streaked out the plate and wouldn't have gotten a mold colony, right? <clears throat> But uh, he was not able to purify the compound. In 1928, they didn't have a whole lot of, I don't know, purification schemes. And he was, well, kind of an amateur microbiologist. So he couldn't purify the chemical compound. All he could do was get crude extracts of uh, the media that the penicillium mold was growing in, and he couldn't feed that to the patients. That would make them sick or even possibly kill them. Uh, so the first antibiotic that clinically became available was uh, uh, one of the sulfur drugs, the first sulfur drug, sulfa, sulfonamide, and it was available in 1935. Uh, penicillin, penicillin G, specifically speaking, didn't become uh, available in the clinic until uh, World War II. It was the 1940s. All right, any question about that? Sorry, so do we don't need to know the exact dates, right? We just need to no. know the order and the names? Yes, you just need to know first Ehrlich came up with his magic cure that could come up, cure syphilis, uh, and it was an arsenic compound. And then you need to know Alexander Fleming discovered, you should know penicillin G. Uh, and then the sulfa drugs became clinically available. Okay, so you just need to know that it happened in that order. You don't need to know what year, okay? Well, let's talk just a little bit about microbes and uh, how they can cause human disease and why sometimes we call them the flora, like the microflora. And you might hear me saying that term because that was the term used when I took microbiology. And bacteria were once classified as plants. And that's where the term flora came for, for microbes. Of course, now that is replaced by microbiota. The microorganisms are no longer classified as plants. They actually are in two domains themselves, archaea and bacteria. And so the correct term we should use is the normal microbiota, the microbes that are normally present in and on a person. In all animals and plants host uh, a microbial community. They live in symbiosis 
with the um, the host, meaning their, their normal microbiota lives in symbiosis with them. And it's central to that individual or organism's uh, welfare. They help defend the organism from, well, let's talk about a human person. They help defend the person from a human pathogen, as well as they add to that individual's health. As I mentioned, uh, some of the normal microbiota help us digest food. Others uh, actually give us vitamins. But not all of them are beneficial. Some of them are just oh, commensal, meaning uh, they don't do us any harm and we're providing them with a home. Some of them are in uh, mutualism. They're benefiting us and we're benefiting them because we're giving them a home. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the normal microbiota. Uh, that's found on a person's skin, in their oral and nasal cavities, in the respiratory tract, not so much in the lungs, so it's more the upper respiratory tract, although there can be organisms uh, in the lung. Uh, it's usually a bad thing if my, lots of microbes are growing in the lung. They're found in our digestive tract, uh, in the uh, lower urethra, although in, in fact it's found totally uh, certain organisms all the way up to the bladder. Uh, that's a recent finding, by the way. Uh, if you have an older textbook, more than 15 years old, they won't know that the upper urethra uh, did have some normal microbiota and the bladder has some normal microbiota. Normally, if things are growing in the bladder, it causes a, a bladder infection, but uh, there are some, not very many, but some microbes that are in the human bladder. <clears throat> They're not usually found in internal tissues and organ, like muscle or blood or the spinal fluid. And, only, and they're only found in those positions if there's an infection that's infected that internal tissue. So our body spends a lot of uh, time uh, keeping the blood and the uh, uh, internal tissues uh, sterile. <clears throat> our immune system prevents microbial growth from growing there. And some of the normal microbiota, they help prevent the growth of human pathogens. They complete heat for re resources. Some of them secrete toxic substances that inhibit the growth of pathogens. Uh, some of them, as I mentioned, help us um, digest our food, give us nutrients and growth factors like uh, bacteria, help provide us with fol folic acid and vitamin K. All right, any questions about that? So the normal microbiota do not normally cause disease. In a healthy individual, they do not usually cause disease. However, they can cause disease in certain circumstances. And when they cause disease, we call it a uh, um, opportunistic infection by the normal microbiota. And that would be when the normal microbiota is growing in a place where it should not grow or growing in numbers it should not be. Like we all have a little bit of uh, yeast on our skin. It's part of our normal microbiota. But especially if you take antibiotics or something that depresses your bacteria flora, the yeast can sometimes bloom and that can give rise to a yeast infection. And so that would be when the yeast on our skin is growing in much greater numbers than it should be. Any questions about any of that? So let's talk a little bit about microbes and human disease. 
An infectious disease results when a pathogen overcomes the host resistance. And of course, that would be caused by a pathogenic microbe, like Staphylococcus aureus can be a human pathogen. Uh, the bad news is uh, about 20% of Americans have Staphylococcus aureus on their skin. And these individuals are much more likely to get a skin infection than the other 80% of Americans that don't have Staphylococcus aureus on their skin. All right, any questions about that part? If not, let's talk about emerging infectious diseases, sometimes abbreviated EID. This is a new or changing disease that is increasing or has the potential to increase in incidence. And can anyone tell me an emerging infectious disease? I'm gonna step out of the picture here and blow my nose, but you can answer the question. Come on, don't be shy. COVID-19. Yeah, COVID-19. We're currently under an emerging and infectious disease. And when we talk about viruses, I've got about three slides that talk about COVID-19 because it's such a big part of our lives now. And uh, you should be taking precautions because even of young individuals, it can occasionally kill. So let's talk just briefly about emerging infectious diseases. This section combines textbook material from chapters one and chapter 14, pages 417 to 419 of the custom edition of the text, which I know nobody has, or at least it hasn't come yet. An emerging infectious disease or one that is new or changing or is increasing in incidence in the recent past like I suppose you could say AIDS is uh, an emerging infectious disease, although it's not increasing really in prevalence now. It is fairly new. Before about 1980, humans didn't know about it. And I think the first human case they know of uh, HIV infection in humans happened in the late 1950s someplace in Africa, and they have a tissue sample uh, from that patient. And of course, the uh, people back then didn't realize it was a new infectious disease. They just knew that this patient wasted away. And it actually was in the United States in the 1960s. They have a few patients where the patient just wasted away. They had AIDS, but nobody knew what it was. And, and uh, fortunately, it didn't spread in the United States in 1960. Uh, but they remembered those patients because the, they weren't able to do anything for them. And they went back to their samples and discovered, oh my goodness, they had HIV. But uh, fortunately, it didn't spread in the United States and probably didn't spread in uh, outside of Africa at that time. Uh, but it had gotten into the United States as early as the 1960s. And don't ask me the exact year, I don't remember. <clears throat> so an emerging infectious disease is caused by a category of a microbe, and it can be a, a viral, it can be bacterial, it can be fungal, it can be a protozoa, it can be a helminth, and it can be a prion. In a sense, because prions were not known before, I don't remember if it was 1970s or the 1980s. You could also say these are all emerging infectious diseases. But prions have actually been around, at least in Europe, for centuries. And sheep farmers have been dealing with uh, uh, prion disease for a long time, at least in Europe. There's various factors that contribute to the emergence of an EID. 
Uh, some factors that contribute to the emergence of an EID include uh, microbial adaption or mutation. And with COVID-19, it appears that that was a new virus. We'll talk about that when we talk about viruses. And that might be why it never was spreading in the human population. And that is that this virus is a recombination from about three other viruses. And so that's probably why it's new. Um, and then global human travel tends to spread around emerging infectious diseases. And so before, I don't know, the 1950s, you didn't have disease happening and spreading quite as rapidly as uh, it does today. Uh, now, certainly there was, uh, I think it was called the Spanish flu or the pig flu or the swine flu, something like that, that hit around 1917 and 18. And this flu was very much like COVID-19. It went around killing people. And I think in the United States, it killed 400,000 people. And that was the winter of 1917 and 1918. It probably, it's called the Spanish flu, but it probably actually started in the United States. And uh, uh, anyways, it was a flu that was uh, 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 lethal and more lethal than the normal flu. And it just did spread worldwide. Um, it is true, it never got to Australia until the winter of 1918, but uh, uh, it did go globally even far back as uh, that time. <clears throat> uh, humans are moving into previously inhabited, uninhabited locations, and that can bring new diseases to humans. And I'm trying to think of an example that happened in Africa. Uh, but I don't remember the name of that disease. And then global climate change can also cause emerging infectious diseases. For one thing, we used to have malaria in the United States and because of the, uh, the uh, warming climate, we're, there's concern that uh, malaria is uh, uh, advancing further north and there's concern that it may come back to the United States because malaria is spread by a mosquito, which is found in the Gulf states and the Southern states. And how we got rid of malaria is we just drained the swamps and we got rid of it uh, uh, before they had an anti-malaria drug. Some factors that can contribute to the emergence of an EID are genetic recombination, and that happens all the time with the flu virus, uh, but actually it looks like that is how uh, COVID-19 came about uh, from recombination of different viruses. And there could be an evolution of new strains. Actually, COVID-19 is an example of that. Uh, also, uh, uh, cholera 139, which I think hit Latin America a few years, that would be about 10 years ago. Uh, inappropriate use of antibiotics and pesticides can lead to the emergence of an EID. And uh, antibiotic resistant strains are uh, an example of that. Uh, uh, MRSA, sometimes pronounced MRSA, is an example of that. Changes in the weather patterns and global warming, I already talked about that, can lead to uh, 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 an EID. Modern transportation can uh, spread uh, a disease around, like West Nile virus was never found in the Americas. And somebody brought it in to New York City from the Middle East, actually. And uh, West Nile virus then started spreading from there. I wish when they discovered it in New York City, they just would have 
uh, fumigated the whole city because that would have been the only chance we had to keep West Nile virus out of the America. It's now found in uh, all 49 states. The only state I think it's not found in is Hawaii. Uh, it hasn't been transported to Hawaii yet, but uh, uh, it was just spread by uh, birds and mosquitoes and it just spread from New York City to first New York and then uh, New England and whatever Northern uh, America. And then the virus just spread uh, everywhere. And like I said, it got into birds and then it was transported by birds. And uh, the last I heard, it was being transported into Latin America, but I don't know how far south it's gone. Ecolog ecological disasters and wars can uh, help spread emerging infectious disease. For example, polio, uh, the World Health Organization is trying to eradicate that disease. For a while there, I think it was found in only two or three countries. And both of these countries had fighting going on. I think it was Afghanistan, Afghanistan and uh, maybe uh, North Pakistan was the only two cases uh, where I think it was found because I believe Nigeria got rid of it. But then because of war in Syria, polio came back to Syria. And so a war can lead to the emergence of an infectious EID, emerging infectious disease. Okay, public health failures contribute to that. And uh, like I said, war, leads to uh, public health failure. And that's what happened in Syria. I've already talked about this. Let me just briefly talk about West Nile encephalitis. It's what we call West Nile virus. It was first diagnosed in the West Nile region. That's a ri river in Uganda in 1937. And Later studies show that it was in West Africa, meaning at least in the 1930s and 40s, it had already spread to West Africa. Uh, but from there, people then spread it further. And uh, it, like I said, it appeared in New York City in 1999. That was the first time it was in the Americas. And it's just spread from New York City to large parts of the Americas, certainly uh, all of North America has it. And I don't know how much of Latin America has it. Oh, I'm trying to think, what do I wanna talk about this? Let's talk a little bit about bovine spongiform encephalopathy, uh, more frequently called mad cow disease. It's caused by a prion, the disease is called Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease in humans. And there's two, well, there were two ways that people could get Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease. Uh, well, I guess there's actually three ways you can get Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease. Uh, the first way is you can be born with it. And humans have a, uh, uh, you can say an infect, a, a defective gene. And when you're born with that gene, you have an increased risk of getting Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease. Uh, that runs in families, so people know if it runs in their family. It's really rare, and it was discovered by two doctors, Kreutzfeldt and Jakob. Um, and that was discovered in humans long before mad cow disease happened. Uh, the second way you can get it, and this happens in uh, Papua New Guinea, it's very, very rare. It might even be extinct now in Papua New Guinea. Uh, they used to eat the, uh, their dead. So if a family member died, part of the funeral services was that uh, people ate, I don't know if it was the brains or the entire person who died. And eating the brain of another person is a, a bad thing to do. And it turned out there was a prion in Papua New Guinea. And uh, 
That's why Kuru uh, spread in Papua New Guinea. Fortunately, before even the missionaries came to the island, the uh, mothers discovered that when their children, and of course them, the, the, the adults were eating the brains of the uh, dead people, that uh, there would be an increased risk of getting Kuru. And so the mothers stopped having their children and themselves eating the dead. And then the missionaries came to Papua New Guinea and uh, they were largely responsible for getting rid of uh, Kuru because they thought it was a, a sin to eat the dead and they really pushed down, uh, kept it from being known. But it was discovered by anthropologists, I don't know if it was the 1930s and the 1940s, that men were still eating the dead if they weren't Christians. And so Kuru was uh, in Papua New Guinea, uh, at least in modern times when, when people were able to write about it. But I think today Kuru in Papua New Guinea is pretty much extinct, and it's largely because of uh, the uh, abandonment of eating the dead. Any questions about that? The third way that people can get Grootsfeldt Jakob disease happen mostly in England, and that is when uh, a person ate tainted beef that came from a mad cow, okay? And that was the prion was in the beef, and if you ate too much of it, you consumed enough prion that you got essentially mad cow disease, but in people they don't call it that. It's called Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease. <clears throat> I don't remember the exact numbers, but uh, it was between 100 and 150 people who came down with Kreutzfeldt Jakob disease. And for some reason, cats were also susceptible to it. And so they came down with, I think they called it mad cow disease among the cats. So British cats and British people came down with it in the 1980s. And that's because the British were feeding cattle the brains of other cattle. <clears throat> Any question about that? We'll talk a little bit about that when we're talking about viruses and prions. Uh, bacteriuremia and pneumonia have become an emerging infectious disease largely caused by antibiotic resistant bacteria. And there are two strains which are antibiotic resistant. And it's saying methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. That's an older term. I should go in there and correct that. That's actually multi-drug resistant Staphylococcus aureus now, meaning it can be resistant to other antibiotics than just methicillin. It can be resistant. There are some strains of MRSA which are resistant to all known antibiotics. And then there's also antibiotic Streptococcus pneumoniae. And so that these are the two uh, emerging infectious diseases that cause bacteriuremia and pneumonia. And it's a concern for the healthcare workers because if it is resistant to all known antibiotics, what do you treat the patients with? Uh, there are only experimental treatments that you can use. And, and there are a few, like uh, there are five hospitals in the United States that can treat uh, multi-drug resistant Staphylococcus aureus with uh, a viral therapy. And this virus goes in and lives in the cells of Staphylococcus aureus. There are other treatments you can use. Like if it's only on the skin, you can actually apply honey to the skin. And that, for some reason, maybe it's uh, osmotic pressure, I don't know. Uh, tends to kill MRSA. And I don't know what they have for Streptococcus pneumoniae. All right, any question about that? Another emerging infectious disease is necrotizing fasciitis. If you've never heard of that, 
you may have heard of the term flesh eating uh, bacteria. Uh, it is mostly caused by Streptococcus pyogenes, but there have been a few cases of flesh eating bacteria caused by Staphylococcus aureus. And so that's uh, uh, within the last 10 years, they discovered that uh, there are a few cases of necrotizing fasciitis that are caused by Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, this is a really dangerous disease because uh, the bacteria, when it gets on your skin, it literally just eats the flesh. And when it was first discovered in, was that the 1980s? The best treatment they had for it, because it was somewhat resistant to antibiotics, was actually coat a towel with bleach and then put it on the skin. And obviously bleach is something that's pretty harsh on human flesh, but uh, the disease was so severe that uh, this is the treatment they developed in the 1980s. I don't know if that's still used today, but uh, uh, it was a really serious disease. We'll just word it that way. Any questions about that? And it's actually increased in incidence since they first discovered it. Uh, Ebola is an emerging infectious disease. And I just read an article, I think it was two days ago, that there's a new case of Ebola outbreak someplace in the Congo. I think it is West Congo. It's caused by the Ebola virus causing hemorrhagic fever with failure of blood clotting, and uh, people just bleed when they get this disease, and it comes out of all of their orifices. Uh, it was first, the virus first discovered in the Ebola River in Congo, and there are outbreaks of it every few years. Uh, we've recently learned that the reservoir of Ebola is bats. And apparently the virus doesn't cause Ebola in bats, but when it gets in humans, it's a very serious disease. And depending on the strain, uh, between 20 to 80% of the patients will die of Ebola. Some of the strains are, are more severe than others. Bird flu was a real concern a few years ago. They, it is a uh, flu virus that spreads very easily among birds. And when people get it, it uh, was very severe, oftentimes fatal. And there was real concern that it might spread from birds to people. It seems like we've lived with this disease now for maybe 15 or 20 years. It doesn't seem that that virus spreads among people and the virus is not showing any inclination to really spread among people. So there's less concern about it now than there was like 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, SARS was a coronavirus that hit China I think in 2003, and it's related to COVID-19, and it causes severe acute respiratory syndrome. And it actually was much more lethal than uh, COVID-19. Fortunately, uh, China, it did spread outside of China, but China got it under control. And the few cases that happened outside of China, they also controlled it. And this virus disappeared in 2003 or 2004. I think it was the winter of 2003 is when it started. And uh, fortunately, the world was able to control it and it did not spread. COVID-19, as you know, spreads very easily among humans and they never got it under control and it spread well beyond China. 
and there are cases of it spreading in the United States now, at least as early as in January. So it's went, and in Europe as well. So it spread out of China much earlier than we ever thought, and was spreading in the United States much earlier, at least a month earlier than we knew it was spreading in the United States. Any question about that? Oh, do I want to talk about hantivirus? That's uh, a virus that uh, was first identified in 1951. You don't need to know the year in Korea. And that's why it's called hantivirus. It comes from the Hantain River. Uh, it was seen in the United States in the, what do they call that? Where the four states touch each other, that region of the United States in 1995. Uh, it, is a US virus that probably came to US from rats sometime around the 1900. And uh, it, uh, like I said, uh, was spreading among people in the four states. What do they call that area? There's a term for it, where the four states touch each other. Uh, four corners. Say again? The four corners. The four corners, thank you. Um, uh, what was happening is, is that rodents were getting into people's houses and then urinating on their dishes or in their food. And then people were using the dishes or eating the food and they were picking up the antivirus that way. So if you have rodents in your house, make sure you always have clean dishes and clean food before you eat it. I uh, already mentioned that AIDS was uh, an emerging infectious disease. It was first identified in the United States in 1981, but like I said, it was in Africa at least as long as the 1950s. It's a worldwide epidemic infecting 40 million people. It's a sexually transmitted disease. Hmm. It says here that uh, HIV and AIDS in people 13 to 24 years of age uh, is the highest risk group. And 44% uh, uh, of the cases are female, 63, so I guess, what is that, 66% are male, and 63% of the cases are African Americans. <clears throat> AIDS is a disease that everyone can get, but uh, it seems to be brought over to the United States, or at least it got into the, the uh, homosexual population, and then they spread it in the United States early on, but uh, it is now uh, every group, if you're sexually active, you're at risk for getting HIV. Anthrax. Uh, actually, this uh, disease is, was only an emerging infectious disease in 2001. Uh, uh, it was a disease discovered by uh, Dr. Koch in 1877. You don't need to know that year, but you should know that Dr. Koch uh, discovered Bacillus anthraxis and proved that that bacteria causes the disease anthraxis. In 2001, there was somebody who was mailing it around, and it was a weaponized version of uh, uh, Bacillus anthraxis that he was mailing. And it turns out that this is a guy that had worked for the military, and he had worked, or at least had access to the lab, who made a weaponized Bacillus anthraxis. And the reason why he may, was mailing it around was is that he wanted the government to buy an antibiotic that worked and protected it against anthrax because he was a major stockholder in the, the antibiotic, okay? And uh, they actually arrested him, and he was going to be brought to trial, but he committed suicide in, uh, 
in prison. So uh, if you never heard about that, that was the case. Why did my window die here? All right. Uh, any questions about any of that? That's it for emerging infectious diseases. Let me briefly look, see, 215. Let's go on for just a few slides of our next chapter, chapter three, observing microorganisms. But I promise I'll let you out 13 minutes early, 15 minutes early. All right, any questions before we get started? Can you guys see the screen here? Chapter three? Hello? I don't see anything. All right. I can't see it. All right, can you see it now? I yes. see it. Okay, all right. Oh, come on, just a minute. So I always, or most of the time, I try to give you a, a screen showing you the major goals and the rough outline for chapter three. Know the terms, know what is resolution, refraction, what a stain is, basic and acidic dyes, how to make a smear preparation, what a mordant is, and peptidoglycan. I think we've talked briefly about peptidoglycan, but we'll talk about it at greater, uh, at greater length in this lesson. Understand the relative sizes of organisms and the properties they have under a microscope. Understand the major differences between a light microscope and the electron microscope. Understand why staining improves resolution, why when you look at something under a microscope, it looks better if you've got it stained. Understand that there are three types of stain. There's a simple stain, a differential stain, and a special stain. And then understand the Gram stain. You should know its procedure and the basis for why it is giving differential staining. Any questions about any of that? Oh, sorry. I think I'll go to the screen here. This one's a little small. You should understand the metric system. This is the units of measurement that are used in science and in medicine. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, meaning it's a system based on units of 10, like uh, 100,000 millimeters equals one meter and uh, 10 millimeters equals, let's see if I can remember this right, a uh, centimeter. 10 centimeters equal a decimeter, which actually I've got down here. You just can't see it very well. Um, <clears throat> so let's start with the table here. A kilometer, that's a thousand meters. So kilo is meaning a thousand. A meter is the, uh, the basic unit of measurement. And uh, there are hectometers and decameters, but you don't need to know those terms. Uh, a decimeter is one tenth of a meter. A centimeter is one hundredth of a meter. So you could say there's 10 centimeters in a decimeter. Uh, a millimeter is one thousandth of a meter. And then the next one you should know is a micrometer is one over uh, a million or 10 to the six uh, of a meter. Uh, this is the size, sorry, I'm moving my mouse here. A micrometer is the size we use in the uh, microscope. And you might know that a nanometer, that's the size you see under the electron microscope. And there's a, 
uh, one times 10 to the ninth nanometers in one meter. You do not need to know how to convert between metric and English. That's really difficult, but you should know how to convert and metric system and you only need to know the kilometer, the meter, the decimeter, the centimeter, the millimeter, and the micrometer. And, you know, I won't ask you questions about all the other terms like what's a picometer. Um, I won't ask you to convert from metric to English or English to uh, metric. You should know this not only in kilometers, but you could use these some same terms in grams, like a kilogram, or in liters. So grams is a measurement of weight, and uh, uh, liters is a measurement of uh, volume. And you got a kilo liter, you got a, excuse me, a uh, liter, and uh, uh, centiliter, uh, and then of course you have meters for measurements in uh, length. So you should know those terms. And here's why you should really pay attention to the metric system. This map is showing you all the countries in the world that do not use the metric system. And what do you know about the countries that do not use the metric system. What can you say about it? Nobody's going to say anything, huh? Well, if you notice, with the exception of the United States, they're all little countries, and there aren't very many countries in the world that are not using the metric system. And I think Burma is in the process of converting to the metric system. Of course, the United States is in the process of converting to the metric system. And we have been in the process of converting to the metric system. I think it was Thomas Jefferson was the first president who suggested the United States should convert to the metric system. So we've been in the process for a long time. And we'll probably never get there because United States really doesn't want to use the metric system. You should know the typical size of microorganisms and you don't need to know that a eukaryotic cell is between 10 and 500 micrometers because really that's just an average. But you should know a eukaryotic cell is about 10 times the size of a prokaryotic cell, which is about 10 times the size of a virus. And when you look at a virus by its diameter, it's between 0 0.02 to 0 0.44 micrometers. Okay? The biggest, biggest virus by diameter is megavirus. And the biggest virus lengthwise is actually Ebola, which gets to almost one uh, micrometer long, but uh, the virus is less than 0 .44, 0 0.44 micrometers in diameter because it's a long skinny virus. All right, any questions about any of that? No? Well, I think I've shown you this slide before. You should also know the relative sizes of things. I'm not going to ask you to tell me what is the size of a human height, what is the size of a chicken egg. Actually, I don't even know what that would be in, in the metric system. I'm not going to ask you that, but you should know a human is bigger than a chicken egg, which is bigger than a frog egg, which is bigger than a eukaryotic cell, which is bigger than a bacteria cell, which is bigger than a virus, which is bigger than I don't know, molecules like a protein, which is bigger than an atom, okay? So you should know those relative things. And this scale here is showing you uh, what we observe under the light microscope, what you can observe under the electron microscope, and what you can observe under the human eye. 
And really, the only thing I would ask you uh, about would be uh, in bacteria is uh, can you see a bacteria with the human eye? And the answer is no. You have to have a light microscope to see bacteria. For most eukaryotic cells, you also have to have a, uh, uh, a light microscope. But if you know, the yolk of a chicken egg is actually one cell. And that is probably the biggest cell that any of you have ever seen. Although if you've ever seen the yolk of a turkey, egg, that would be a bigger cell, but not very many people have seen that. And then the biggest cell would be the yolk of a, what is that, an ostrich egg, and I'm sure nobody's ever seen that. I've never seen that. Um, all right, any questions on that? If not, we're going to end here, and you guys have more than 15 minutes. Um, more than 15 minutes of class let out early. You happy? I'll see you in the lab at 2.30. Okay? Okay. All right, see ya.